Thank you. I, uh, it's good to be home. And I have to say that this award is so meaningful to me. It's humbling because of all these heroic women who got this award. It's amazing to be on that list. But the award is especially um, symbolic to me because it's for mentoring, which is my passion. And the greatest thing that I do is get to be with young scientists in the lab and watch them as they turn into these amazing creatures that change the way we think about how the world works. So to FASAV, I just want to thank you for choosing me. It's an absolute delight and an honor. And um, in that spirit, this, I'm going to tell you two brand new stories today, science stories, that were done by uh, a postdoc and a graduate student in the lab. So I thought what I would do is tell you two unpublished stories in the uh, sort of spirit of this not that I was such a great mentor, but because these are the things that happen in my lab by people that are like students and postdocs. And so I want to just share with you some of the newest stuff we're doing um, that, back home at Princeton. So to get started, uh, at the heart of my lab, the thing that we always want to understand is how do bacteria get any bang for their buck? And so we know um, historically about all these terrible things that bacteria do. Increasingly, we're learning about all these magical things that bacteria do, these beneficial bacteria that, that are essential for making life on Earth possible. So in that context, we get bacteria. They can kill us, and they can keep us alive. But the question that my lab is trying to ask is not the mechanisms of how they do those things, but how can it be that these tiny, tiny critters can be so powerful? So the question is, how do they actually achieve these amazing feats? And we think that part of the answer to that is that these bacteria don't act as individuals. They talk to each other with a chemical language. They work in groups. They carry out tasks in synchrony. And that is how they can manage to do all of these things that we know about and that we're learning about that bacteria do on Earth. And so that process of bacteria communicating and acting in groups, as you just heard, is called quorum sensing. And so the way we now think about bacteria is that they live in two different modes. They're either acting as individuals or they're acting in groups. And the way they distinguish between those two lifestyles is with this chemical communication process called quorum sensing. So in my cartoon, when bacteria are alone, when they're at low cell density, they want to have the gene expression going, program going that's good for acting as an individual. So they're carrying out some subset of the tasks that they can do. But among those things they're, making, they're doing is that they're making and releasing small molecules that are these triangles that we call autoinducers. And what happens, they're diffusible molecules. So what happens is when the bacteria are at low cell density, the world is big, the bacteria are small, these autoinducers diffuse away, the bacteria can't detect them, and that says act as an individual. But then as the bacteria grow and divide, since all of the cells are making a share of the autoinducer, the concentration of these extracellular chemicals increases in proportion to cell number. And when the molecules hit a particular threshold amount, the bacteria can detect them, and they infer by that detection event that they must have neighbors around. So they actually use the molecules as a proxy for cell number. So when the bacteria detect these molecules in unison, they change their behaviors, and typically they turn on and off hundreds and hundreds of genes that underpin group behaviors. So the way bacteria know when they're alone or know when they're together is by whether or not these molecules are there. And so that is called quorum sensing. And I have these bacteria drawn in blue because this was originally discovered in these beautiful bioluminescent marine vibrios. But what we now know is that this is common in the bacterial world. And in many, many instances, these bacteria, the kinds of genes these bacteria control with quorum sensing are biofilm formation, so how they sit on surfaces, and then the group-wide production of virulence factors. So what we know beyond uh, many other collective behaviors that bacteria do, in fact, that being able to have quorum sensing is essential for virulence. And so there's a lot of work in the field now to try to disrupt these communication circuits to make new kinds of antimicrobials. So what I want to do now is to um, tell you about the mechanisms of how this works. And so I'm going to talk today about vibrios because that's where we do most of our work and because that's where we know the most because we've known about vibrios and quorum sensing the longest. But the principles I'm going to tell you are conserved in all quorum sensing systems. So the bacteria tinker with the parts and they tinker with the mechanisms. But the ideas that I'm going to tell you are sort of um, transcendent across the, the world of bacteria. So what we believe is that the bacteria have to have at least three words in this chemical language. 
So they have a molecule that is used for intraspecies communication. So in the case of this Vibrio, this molecule, as far as we know, is made by one Vibrio species and detected by that Vibrio species. So this molecule, this homoserine lactone, tells the bacteria when it measures that molecule, you are my twin, you are my clone. This is for intraspecies communication. But then there's a molecule that we discovered that all Vibrios make. But as far as we can tell, no other bacteria make it. So this molecule is for intragenous communication. So this molecule says you're my twin. This molecule says you're my cousin. And then there's a molecule that we found that all bacteria make, both gram-negatives, gram-positives, and they all make and use the identical molecule. So this molecule is rather generic, and we think it's for interspecies communication. So what we used to think is that these molecules were used for counting cell number, and that's true. But beyond counting, the thing that these molecules encode is something about how closely or distantly my neighbors are related to me. So when bacteria measure these blends, they not only get the number of bacteria present, they also get something about who their neighbors are and whether they're friend or foe. And then they change their behavior based on the blend of these molecules, whether there's more of the, they and their kin around or whether there's more of somebody else in the neighborhood. And then they alter their behaviors based on the composition and the concentration of the blend of molecules. So that's sort of the overarching way quorum sensing works. And so now to get more into really how, this, uh, how they integrate this information, here's what happens. At low cell density, so when the molecules are not there, each of these receptors, these cognate receptors, they're kinases. And they funnel phosphate to this transcription factor called LUX-O. So at low cell density, LUX-O is phosphorylated. And what it does is it turns on the expression of a set of genes that encode bacterial small RNAs. So these are the microRNAs of bacteria. And so these small RNAs get made at low cell density, and they act post-transcriptionally. So what they do is that they go and they sit on the messenger RNA encoding a protein called AFA, and they reveal the ribosome binding site. So at low cell density, this protein AFA gets made, it's a transcription factor, and it is the master regulator of all the individual behaviors. But then these small RNAs can also act negatively. So they sit on the ribosome binding site of the messenger RNA encoding this protein called HAPR, and they occlude the ribosome from getting on. So this protein, this RNA gets destroyed, and HAPR isn't made. That's good because it controls group behaviors. So at low cell density, phosphate goes to LUXO, AFA gets made, and the bacteria act as individuals. Then as they grow and divide, these autoinducers kick in, and when the autoinducers bind the receptors, that flips a switch. And these receptors change from being kinases to being phosphatases. So now phosphate gets pulled out of the system. When LUXO is dephosphorylated, it's inactive, so these small RNAs don't get made. So now they can't activate AFA, so it goes away, but they can't repress production of HAPR. So now HAPR gets made, and it controls 600 genes that allow group behaviors. So the way it really works is these two transcription factors are alternatively being made depending on whether or not these autoinducers are there, which depends on whether or not the bacteria are alone or in a group. And so that's basically how the circuit works. The bacteria tinker with what the molecules are. They can make, use more. They can use fewer. Some of these components change. But basically, this is the idea of how quorum sensing allows bacteria to change between these two very different lifestyles. And so my lab. Uh, discovered of everything you see here, and we work on all these different parts of the circuit. What are the molecules? What kind of information do they encode? How do the bacteria integrate the information? And then what actually happens down here when these bacteria are changing their lifestyles? And so as I told you at the beginning, I want to tell you two new stories about, just to give you a flavor of what my gang is doing back in Princeton. So first I'll tell you a story, a mechanism story, about how this works, and then I'll tell you a story about biofilms, about the behavior. So something about the circuit, and something about what they actually do. So everything I'm going to tell you about today is in this pathogen Vibrio cholera. And so as I told you, bacteria can use different blends. This guy only uses two quorum sensing molecules as far as we know. So at low cell density, right, phosphate flows through this circuit. This pr protein AFA gets made, and its job in cholera is to turn on biofilms and turn on virulence genes. So at low cell density, when the bacteria gets into the host, it comes in with its entire virulence program running. 
Then, when the autoinducers kick in and the sensors reverse, at high cell density, AFA gets shut off, HAPR gets turned on, and HAPR's job is to shut down all of the canonical virulence factors and turn on the dispersal program. So cholera is this really insidious bacteria. You get it from you know, eating uh, contaminated food or water. It gets in. It makes a biofilm. It's really, really virulent. And then when the autoinducers kicks in, it, 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 so it's dividing like crazy in the host intestine. And then when the autoinducers kick in, cholera shuts that down, and HAPR makes it cut itself off the intestinal epithelium, and out it comes by the gazillions to infect the next host. So it has to have quorum sensing to be a pathogen, but the quorum sensing cascade is tuned to make the bacteria get out and get into the next host. So what that means is that if we could make a molecule that turns on quorum sensing, that should shut down virulence in cholera. So we were interested to try to think about being able to manipulate the circuit that way. And so what we decided to do then was to do a screen for molecules that were medicine-like that would turn on quorum sensing and then hopefully shut down pathogenicity. And so we screened for those molecules just with a chemical library, and we got agonists of the receptors, and we've already published those, so I won't talk about that. But then in new work, what we got was a really interesting molecule that works from the inside of the cells on Luxo. You know, so nature gave us molecules already that work at the receptors, and so we got some more, and so that was interesting. But we've never had a molecule that works internally that lets us probe the system. And so now what you have to know is that Luxo acts negatively. So an inhibitor of Luxo turns the system into the high cell density mode. Okay, so the inhibitor that we got, we named AZU, and this is the structure of the molecule. This protein, or this molecule inhibits Luxo, which flips cholera into high cell density mode. And so we wanted to understand how this molecule AZU inhibits this transcription factor Luxo. And so the problem was we didn't understand how Luxo works in the first place. So first let me tell you what we knew. So Luxo is what's called a triple A plus ATPase. And you guys have heard about these. They're widespread in the bacterial world like dynein. There's all kinds of um, triple A plus ATPases. In bacteria, the famous one is called NTRC. And what these proteins do is when they're phosphorylated, so in the case of Luxo, this is at low cell density, they get phosphorylated by a receptor. Then what they do is they sit on DNA, right? It's a transcription factor. They interact with this, this um, alternative sigma factor called sigma 54, and then they're ATPases. So they burn ATP, and that energy from ATP hydrolysis allows Luxo to open up the DNA, to melt the DNA, and then it can turn on transcription, in this, in this case, of those small RNAs. So that's low cell density, and then at high cell density in the quorum sensing cascade, remember Luxo is dephosphorylated, so it's not an ATPase in that mode. And so somehow, this molecule, AZU, converts Luxo from this state to this state, which then makes cholera B in high cell density dispersal mode. And so we wanted to understand how that works. And so to do that, what we decided to do was to take a structural approach to try to understand how does Luxo naturally go between these states, and then how does AZU push Luxo into that high cell density inactive state. And so what we did, uh, a graduate student, Amanda Hurley, teamed up with my colleague Fred Hewson, and we crystallized Luxo three times. We crystallized it, the apoprotein, we crystallized it bound to ATP, so remember it's an ATPase, and we crystallized it bound to this molecule, AZU, and we solved the structures. So here's the uh, overall look. Luxo is a hexamer, and this is very common for these AAA plus ATPases. They're often hexamers, and they're in rings. And so now if we zoom in and just look at one monomer, I'm going to show it to you three times as crystal structures. So this is the apoprotein. This is the naturally inhibited, inactive Luxo. And so all of these AAA plus ATPases look kind of the same in that they have a catalytic domain that's where, where ATP hydrolysis occurs, and then they have a regulatory domain. So this is the part that gets phosphorylated by the sensor that says be an ATPase or not. And so we crystallized the structure, and what was interesting when we compared it to all the other crystal structures of AAA plus ATPases was this yellow little finger. So I'm going to tell you right now, this is where ATP binds. And what was interesting was that linking the regulatory domain to the catalytic domain was this little yellow finger that was sitting right in the active site where ATP needs to bind. 
So that was interesting because remember, this protein in the unphosphorylated state is inhibited. And so we think then that this is like a natural inhibitor, right? It's like a little linker that stops ATP from binding, and then that's how the protein is regulated normally. And so then proof for that, I told you we crystallized it with ATP. And sure enough, ATP sits right where that linker was. And when ATP is bound, the protein sort of stretches out, and this little yellow linker has to get out of the way. And so what this is then is a competitive intramolecular repression mechanism. So this is the protein, the active protein, the linker folds up and gets out of the way. And then we crystallized it with AZU, and AZU is sitting right where ATP was. So sure enough, AZU is a competitive inhibitor. If we add AZU, Luxo can't hydrolyze ATP. And so what we think we found with our AZU molecule is simply what nature already gave us, right? So this little yellow finger sits in there to inhibit the protein, and then we found a molecule that does, that sort of traces the exact same path as the normally inhibited inhibited linker. And so that's a brand new mechanism of inhibition. And we did some experiments to prove we're right. Like we can add just the linker and a little bit of the protein and in trans, and it works to inhibit it. We can make mutants that pop that linker out, and the protein becomes activated. Right? So we're kind of interested in this mechanism because no other AAA plus ATPase, to our knowledge, has this kind. Usually they just make inactive dimers. So we're interested about why Vibrio's have that, right, and why our, and how our molecule works to recapitulate that. So anyway, so now I've shown you the mechanism. We know how the AZU works. We know it shuts down the ATPase, right, but remember what's supposed to happen if, if my gang is right is that this molecule flips cholera into high cell density mode so they should turn off virulence. So we wondered, can you really do it? Can you actually take a synthetic molecule and shut down virulence in cholera? And so what Amanda did was she, this is a Western blot, is she measured this protein called TCPA. And so that is called the toxin co-regulated pillus. It's the first virulence factor that cholera deploys that lets it adhere to the intestine and make a person sick. And so what you can see is that at low cell density, cholera makes a lot of this pillus. But if we add our molecule, AZU, at increasing amounts, in fact, we can completely shut it down. So sure enough, this seems to work, and so now this molecule is going into mice to see whether or not we can actually do something that's practical, which is not what my lab is known for, um, in terms of this disease, cholera. But then a really curious thing, and why, we're, uh, why we think this molecule is particularly interesting, remember it works from the inside of the cell. And so you remember that at the beginning of my talk, I told you that these Vibrios and different bacteria, they use all kinds of different blends of molecules. They need to be able to interpret the correct blend of molecules that tells them something about themselves and their neighbors. So when people try to interfere up here, right, it's hard because bacteria use different molecules. So you have to go bacteria by bacteria by bacteria. And then in the case of Vibrios, of course, you've heard about cholera, but there's lots of pathogenic Vibrios. And so they all use their particular blend of molecules. And then, of course, for the different diseases that these Vibrios cause, they all have their own disease that they cause. And so when people try to modulate down here, again, you have to be very species-specific because they're all deploying these different virulence factors. What's wonderful from my perspective is that in Vibrios, while this changes and this changes, this part of the circuit is in every Vibrio whose sequence is in the database. So they all have Luxo, but Luxo is in no other bacteria other than Vibrios. And so what we showed with this molecule AZU, so we got our hands on all of these pathogens. It shuts down Luxo in every single Vibrio. So it's actually extraordinarily broad spectrum in terms of inhibiting virulence in Vibrios, but it doesn't touch any other AAA plus ATPase. So it doesn't uh, hit NTRC or all these other proteins. So it doesn't kill the bacteria. It doesn't slow their growth. And it doesn't work on any other bacterium. And that, I think, is because of this new mechanism. Because this Luxo has this special mechanism of this intramolecular inhibition. And because AZU targets that mechanism, it only works on Luxo and only in Vibrios. And so this molecule is very broad spectrum, but it's very narrow spectrum at the same time. And so we are really interested in that mechanism, which was just by luck, because we did this screen, and doing the crystal structure, we kind of understand it. But we're now trying to work on this molecule you know, in lots of these pathogenic Vibrios that cause terrible diseases. 
Okay, so that's the first story that gives you an idea of how we, we, live, we like molecules, we like natural ones, and we like synthetic ones, and we like to work on mechanism. Okay, so that's story number one. And now, of course, the truth is, is that what bacteria do is they do these group behaviors. And so what I want to tell you now for the second part of my talk is about what do bacteria actually control with quorum sensing? And the big deal in the field is this process called biofilms, which is how bacteria sit on surfaces and which is how we know, it turns, it's how we know bacteria live in the world. They don't, it turns out they don't actually just live in flasks in Princeton, New Jersey. They actually live, you know, adhere to surfaces all over the earth. And this is the natural state of bacteria. And we have to learn about how they actually do this process. And the reason I'm interested in it is because quorum sensing controls biofilm formation. So we have this cartoon, and this cartoon you're going to notice is 20 years old about how this works. What we think happens is the bacteria swim to the surface and they adhere. And then they begin to divide, adhere to the surface, and then they start to make this extracellular matrix. It's made of proteins, DNA, and polysaccharides. And that covers them in this goop that's like a suit of armor that makes them impervious to insults and to antibiotics. And then they start to grow in this matrix. They make these tower-like things, and then at a certain point, bacteria, probably when they run out of food, they break out, and then they go do it again and again. But this is a cartoon, right? We don't actually know what these stages are, and we don't actually know how these bacteria are, are arranged in these tower-like structures. And that's because bacteria are really tiny, and no one has gotten single-cell imaging of living, growing biofilms. So people have taken pictures of like sort of the global structure and maybe if there's a few colonies in one on the bottom layer, but nobody's actually managed to image these because the bacteria are small and it's really tough. It's been a really tough, they're not, these are opaque, and so it's been a really tough problem to crack. So the thing that I'm interested in is that these bacteria, beyond that, is that these bacteria have a problem. They're in 2D, they're adhered to the surface, but they have to get into 3D because all the goodies are flowing by up here, the nutrients. So how do bacteria, my perspective is, how is this happening? Quorum sensing is controlling it. And how do bacteria manage to be in 2D and 3D at the same time, right? That seems like a conundrum. So we wanted to try to think about this and... Um, and then to show you sort of the state of the art, all the pictures, there are thousands and thousands of papers on biofilms, and all the pictures look like this. It's a bunch of glop, and I can say that because my lab took this picture, right? And so this is a Vibrio cholera biofilm. Cholera biofilms are clonal, so we just put three different fluorescent reporters in, and these are supposed to be those towers. And so this is the state of the art, and if you really want to understand how this is happening, we can't be looking at it like this. So a postdoc joined the lab, a physicist, Jing Yan, and he decided to take a crack at it. And so what he did was he built a custom confocal microscope in which he optimized every single button and dial and everything for bacteria instead of for eukaryotic cells. No offense. Anyway, so what, what he did was he reduced the pinhole size so he wouldn't fry the bacteria. He used really bright reporters, right? And he just sort of tinkered with this machine, and he got, for the first time, single cell imaging of a living, growing biofilm from the founder cell to 10,000 cells. And so now I'll show you his new result. So now you're looking at the bottom layer. This is the surface layer. And he can make these movies by taking a picture every couple, uh, every few minutes. And so what you can see is the bacteria grow from the founder cell, and they spread out on the surface like a pancake. And then they pop up, so they're going to get into 3D, and they make this sort of pancake-like, adhere to the surface uh, layer. And so what he does is he does that, but he does it 150 times, right? So here's the bottom layer. He takes a picture every 20 minutes or so. But then he makes 150 slices, and then he can assemble all those slices. And in fact, he can reconstruct a living, growing, three-dimensional biofilms. This is about 21 microns high. It has 10,000 cells. And so you're looking at it from the side, right? But what I know is where every single cell in that biofilm is, how it is organized relative to its neighbor, and who its mother is, who its grandmother is, and who its great-grandmother is, right? So now we have it, right? We can actually watch these from one cell to the entire biofilm organize themselves. And so by doing these slices and putting it together, Jing can make a model for what happens. And so what we know is that the bacteria swim to the surface, as I told you, and then the first founder cell adheres, and it adheres horizontally. 
and then it begins to grow. So they divide, and then they start to make that polysaccharide matrix, right? And then there's a problem, right? The bacteria are adhered to the surface, but they're dividing. And so there's different forces, one that is pasting you to the surface, and then the one from your brothers and sisters that are trying to push you aside. And so what happens is that the pressure builds up on the middle cells because they're both adhered and they're being shoved. And so simultaneously, they all the forces of the um, shoving overpower the force of adhering to the surface, the cells pop up and then into the vertical direction. Now they solve their problem. They're in 3D. And then cholera divides from its poles, and so the daughter cells are born more into the third dimension, and this goes on and on and on. So again, you're looking from the side. I only have a couple of rows, right? But what you get are these cells that are lined up like soldiers in the middle, vertically. They are packed vertically, and then they have these radial cells around them, and it makes this hemisphere-like structure. Right? So now we know how it happens, but the question is, what's the mechanism involved in that? And so what's great is that we know there are three proteins involved in matrix proteins involved in biofilm formation, all controlled by quorum sensing, obviously, um, and so we can just make mutants and study what happens with these different, uh, in these different uh, mutants. So the first two are redundant. They're called BAP1 and RBMC, and they make the glue, the adhesin that the bottom cells make that adhere the cells to the surface. So what Jing did was he made a mutant in these two proteins and asked, what does this biofilm look like if we knock those two proteins out? And so here's the movie like you saw, and again, this is the bottom slice, and he takes all of the slices. And so what you can see is that now they don't make that pancake, right? They're not adhered to the surface. They're kind of floating around. They're completely disorganized, right? And so again, that's just the bottom layer. And so he puts all the layers together. And what he sees is that if this was the side view of the wild type, what he sees is that the BAP1 RBMC mutant, it makes a sphere, right? Because it doesn't have that glue that pastes it to the bottom of the, uh, to the paste it to the surface, right? And so, you know, maybe this is a biofilm, but the question is, why do the cells have these proteins? I mean, we know why they have them. They have them to adhere it to the surface, but what's so good about this form versus that form? These are still in the third dimension. You know, the, the nutrients are, are available. So what's, what's the, the disadvantage of this structure? And so there could be lots of different things, but we thought of one, which is flow. Flow is ubiquitous in the environment, you know, in your intestine, in the ground, right? right? And, and to be a biofilm, you have to be able to withstand flow and stay adhered to the surface. So what Jing did is to just, we do all this in microfluidic devices, so Jing just added flow and asked what happens. And so what happens if you add flow, 100% of the wild type, they'll stay there. If you make either of the single mutants, they stay there as well. But remember, I told you these are redundant. If you make this double mutant, if you just add gentle flow, in fact, this structure is not a biofilm because it doesn't stay adhered to the surface. It just gets uh, washed away. And so there's at least one disadvantage of making the sphere versus the hemisphere, which is that you're not attached to the surface. So you're not really a biofilm. Okay, so that's two of the pr proteins, the, the glue. The third protein that we know about that, that uh, is involved in biofilm formation is called RBMA, and that's the protein that adheres the sister cells together. And so Jing did the same trick. He made an RBMA mutant and asked what, you know, did the confocal microscopy and ask what happens. And so here what you can see is the founder cell divides, and there's lots of space in between the sister cells because they're not connected to one another. So they actually kind of make the right shape, but what, what hopefully you can see it's a lot looser. Right? And so to really show you that, when he does the side view of the two biofilms, here's the packing in the wild type biofilm, and here's the packing in the RBMA mutant, right? So all the sister cells are far apart from each other. So if we make a cartoon of what that looks like, here's the wild type biofilm that you've been seeing. The RBMA mutant actually makes a huge hemisphere, and all these spaces are filled up by this polysaccharide matrix goop, right? And so now you could, well, we thought, well, why is that so bad? So in this case, right, they're adhered to the surface, so they should withstand flow, but the cells are further apart, but in fact, it's bigger. And so if my logic is right, where the, we, these bacteria are trying to explore the third dimension, these guys actually explore more of the third dimension than the wild type does. So the question is, why is that a bad solution? And of course, there can be a lot of reasons, but one we thought was about invasion. Remember, these cells are packed so tightly together, and they make these clonal biofilms, right? So even if you add isogenic 
bacteria, they can't get in. And so we wondered maybe this is not as good you know, of an army to withstand invasion. And so Jing did an experiment to look at that. What we did was we simply added this, the wild type cholera, planktonic cholera, to the established biofilm. And now the colors are reversed. You're looking down here, and you're looking from the side here. And the yellow cells are the invader. And I hope what you can see is that they can't get in. But in the case of the mutant that makes this looser biofilm, if we add invaders, now the, the, the parent biofilm is blue, and the invaders are yellow. What you can see is that they get right in. And so what we think is that this packing is important. It's like the bacterial tight junctions that, that makes them impervious to these environmental insults, but also, may, also makes them impervious to invaders. And remember, inside the biofilm, all this quorum sensing is going on, and all these public goods are being made. And you want those to go to your daughters, not to anybody who happens to come swimming by who might like to have all of those goodies. And so we think that's one of the reasons why this protein, RBMA, is essential, and why it's really important that the cells are lined up so tightly together. So these are our first two stories with this new technology, but um, right, I think that that is what we've done, right? But I think it's really fun for my lab and hopefully for the field to be able to actually have single cell resolution of these biofilms because now we can actually imagine doing things that, that are just crazy that they haven't been done yet given how much studying of biofilms is done. So just something really easy like what genes turn on where, right? So simple things like making a GFP transcriptional reporter to your favorite gene, like, I don't know, a quorum sensing gene, for example, right? And asking who turns it on in time and in space. That has never been done, right? We don't know what jobs these bacteria carry out inside these biofilms. So now, of course, with this optical technology, we can do that, right? So we're making fusions to every, uh, you know, favorite gene, right, and asking who's doing what. So that's one by one, but on a more global scale, what you might like to ask is in space and time, what are the different jobs? So a new graduate student, Justin Silpi, he got a process called photoconversion working. So there's a protein called EOS that's green, and then if you shine light on it, it turns red. And so what he can do is he can put EOS into these cells and then just zap a particular area, like for example, the bottom cells, and they turn red. Or you could do the middle, or you could do the top. And then what you can do is you just scrape up the entire biofilm, and then you can separate the green ones from the red ones by fax, and then just do microarrays or RNA-seq and ask globally what are all the genes that are turned on or off in the different regions. And so to just prove to you here what he's done is he's got green cells and he shined a little light right there. He's got three or four cells and he can just ask like, what do you do if you're at the periphery, right? And so this is fun for us because we can ask on a global scale. But again, it's still a little bit passive, um, right? We're just asking about what the cells are doing. So the last thing that we're doing is that we've actually got optogenetics working. And so what we can do is on demand, make these bacteria do different things and then ask what are the consequences to the bacteria doing it and then also to its neighbors. So we can just optogenetically say, what happens if you make autoinducers? Or what happens if you make a flagella and think you're supposed to leave? Or what happens if you make the glue, but you're actually not on the bottom of the biofilm. And so you get the idea, this idea of actively making these bacteria do tricks and then ask what happens locally and what happens globally. And so I am super excited about this technology because I think that we can ask, these are actually really simple questions, right? But they've never been asked before in the biofilm field. So my lab is very heavily invested now in doing that. And then of course we have all of these mutants and molecules and things like that that we can put into the fray in those kinds of contexts and ask the only important question, which is what is quorum sensing doing in those biofilms? And of course, they have this very um, clinical relevance because biofilms are essential for bacteria to be pathogens. And so then to step back and finish up, I hope, uh, you know, my lab studies all the parts of this, you know, the chemistry, the physics, the genetics, the uh, engineering now. And like our goal really is to understand how collective behaviors evolved on Earth, how do they get robustness, how do they become immune from cheating, and now how do they work in space and time. And so that's just to give you a little 
a uh, couple stories for today for this nice talk, and then I just want to finish with the real heroes. I, it's really lovely for me to win this award, but I'm not winning it. They are, right? Because you know I get to come here, but the people that are the brains and the heart and the minds that think up all these wonderful ideas and do all this rigorous work are all in this slide. But let me just uh, show you. So that's Amanda. She did all of the uh, Lux O biochemistry and crystallography. This is Jing, he's the physicist that made the microscope. And this is, a, for the young people, this is a first year graduate student, Justin, who did the um, photoconversion and the optogenetics. And then, of course, I wish I could tell you a story about everybody in that um, picture because they all contributed to this award. And so I wanna thank you for having me, thanks for listening. I hope I've woken you up for the real talk, which is Peter Walter coming next. <laughs> um, it's really nice to be here.